My name is Rick Perkins. I'm from the UMass class of 1968. In 1966, I played on the basketball team and got to play with our star player, Clarence Hill. We called him C. Some of the other players from that team and I have decided we wanted to nominate C for the uh, UMass Athletic Hall of Fame. And those players are Frank Stewart, Tim Edwards, Billy Tyndall, now known as Isomai Dean, as well as our classmate, Dr. Cheryl Evans. Uh, Clarence sadly passed away in 2004, uh, and we, without having been named to the Hall of Fame, we felt it was time after all these years that he be nominated. Clarence came to UMass in the fall of 1961 from Roosevelt High School in Washington, D.C. Came from an urban school, came to UMass where there are few African-American students and few African-American uh, basketball players. Uh, he immediately uh, started showing what he could do on the court. Uh, Dr. John Bracey, who was the head of the African-American Studies Department at UMass, actually went to Roosevelt High School in D.C and saw Clarence play and said he was a remarkable offensive player. Uh, I think of him as a shy, quiet man, if you knew him off the court. On the court, when he had that basketball, there was nothing shy about him. And quiet, well, he often seemed to get a quiet 24 points a game. That was his senior year, his junior year, 22 points a game. And for his three-year career, he averaged just under 20 points. He could do so much with the ball. He was a really fine player. And we were very proud and happy that the Hall of Fame Induction Committee and the school have named Clarence uh, to the Hall of Fame. We also want to mention that uh, his family is here uh, to see this induction. And uh, we we're very happy about that. So they could hear about what a fine player Clarence was and how much we all respected his game and enjoyed playing with him. Here's some old video from 1964 showing Clarence number 12 in his playing days. You can see how easily he moves and how quickly and his ability to get to the basket and score points.
If I had to describe Clarence Hill as a college basketball player in one word, I would call him a scorer. I played with him his junior and senior year. He scored 22 and 24 points a game. Uh, what separated him from other players of that era was really two things, his quickness and his ability to score in traffic. Uh, he was kind of like uh, Tiny Archibald of that era. Of that era and uh, maybe Isaiah Thomas, who played for the Celtics the last few years, where he could get into the key with big players and somehow put the ball in the hoop. His signature shot was an early release layup. I guess you would call it a floater. Uh, a big man would be under the hoop. He'd get by his own man, uh, and the big guy would be waiting for him, and then Clarence would release the ball maybe a step over the foul line, the ball would soar 12 feet in the air and go through the hoop. It amazed his teammates, it amazed the crowd. Uh, it was just a fun thing to watch. Uh, Clarence, although he was a score first point guard, he was also an assist man, he would uh, hit the open man. Uh, he was just a fun guy to play with, always had a smile on his face. And uh, I, I remember him fondly. Before the days of the slam dunk contest, Clarence was involved with one of the great dunking exhibitions that UMass had ever seen. It was the 1966 season and we were playing the University of Rhode Island. Rhode Island had a player named Henry Carey. They called him Harry Carey. And he was known to be one of the great leapers of his time. Uh, and I said, as I told you, quiet was the way that we defined Clarence. We didn't know, really know what his capabilities were, at least I didn't. Um, the cage was, fu was filled that night. Everyone was there to see Harry Carey dunk. Well, they weren't uh, disappointed. Carey comes out and jumps, uh, does a one-handed dunk that really shook the cage and the crowd went wild. He went back in line when it's his, his turn to go again. The crowd waited in anticipation and he came down with a two-handed dunk and the crowd went crazy again. And then almost momentarily, there was another roar from the crowd. We looked around, what's happening now? Well, Clarence had come down and did a two-handed dunk that was at least as good as Carrie's dunk. Carey comes down again when it was his turn, and he dunks that ball with a tomahawk. Um, Fifteen seconds later, the crowd is still yelling. Clarence comes down with a better tomahawk. Carey jumped from eight feet from the basket and slammed that ball with authority. Uh, Fifteen seconds later, Clarence comes down and dunks from eight feet. And then Clarence uh, is just watching Carey. Carey comes down with a uh, dunk, where he dunked from about nine feet from the basket. And Clarence comes down nine feet from the basket. Each time, Clarence was matching him dunk for dunk. And here's the man we didn't even know he could dunk. 
and he was dunking, keeping up with one of the great jumpers uh, of our era. Uh, and that's Clarence, when Kerry jumped almost from the foul line and dunked that ball, Clarence matched him. And we realized that not only did we have a great scorer, but we had a great leaper on our team. Quiet man that he was, he never told us, and we didn't know. We always knew he had the shot, but we didn't know he could rise up like that. We are not going to wait my shot. We are going to rise away time to take a shot. We are going to rise away time to take a shot. We are going to rise up, rise up. It's time to take a shot. Rise up, rise up. It's time to take a shot. Rise up, it's time to take a shot. Rise up, take a shot. Rise up, rise up. Take a shot, shot, shot. It's time to take a shot. It's time to take a shot. And I am not going to wait my Thank the Hall of Fame committee uh, for this honor for my, my dad, who uh, did, did pass away. Um, and I'd very much like to thank his teammates and friends, um, and, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a bit. Uh, so my dad and my mom both went to UMass. That's where they met. So I am quite literally a product of, of UMass. Um, and my dad came from a, a very tough neighborhood in Washington, D.C. Uh, and came up here, you can imagine going from inner city, Washington, D.C. He would talk about the gang situation when he was growing up and how you couldn't really, you know, if you had a bike, you had to watch it because it would be stolen uh, if you weren't careful. And he came to Amherst, which I don't think is quite the gang capital of Massachusetts by any stretch of the imagination, but that's, that, that's a, big, a big change. And my dad was a lot younger than I am now when he was here. Um, and so I, I have a little bit of a different perspective as I, as I think about this honor for him. Um, it, it's, it's really humbling for me, especially on behalf of his teammates, that 50 years later, after he had passed away, when there was really no reason for any, any of them to, to, to honor my dad, that they chose to do so and, and went through the process to bring him here. And so I can't thank you all enough, his teammates and friends, on how much it means to him and my family. So thank you to all of them. And I'm also struck by, uh, so my, um, uh, my wife and daughters are here, uh, like my dad's grandkids, Sarah and 
Alyssa, right there, being very, very shy. Uh, they never got to meet my dad. Um, but uh, I hope this experience lets them know what a great man my dad was and, and lets them feel close and I hope it's something that, that they, they definitely remember. Um, I'm trying to think about the kind of person you would have to be. Again, where 50 years later, people go out of their way to remember you. And there must be something really good about you if that's the case you are. I can't remember where my keys are in the morning, let alone who I was doing, what I was doing 50 years ago and who I was doing it with and, and to, to do something here. So that's just uh, really, really uh, incredible. Um, after, after being here, um, my dad became an adjustment counselor and he spent his career, um, kind of went back to his roots a bit, and he spent his uh, career as an adjustment counselor in, in Worcester dealing with kind of the hardest cases, middle school children cases. Um, they actually named uh, part of the school after him um, as, as an award for that. But he would come home, um, you know, and we lived in a, in a small town. It was very much like Amherst, very peaceful, Uxbridge, right on the Rhode Island border off of 146. And he would come home, not too often, but sometimes he would tell stories about what was going on uh, in his, uh, in his, his life uh, at, at work. And the types of kids he was dealing with were, you know, parents, uh, not there or had abuse problems. Uh, he would talk about uh, the fights in the school that he would have to break up and try to keep people on the path. He always said that the girls were a lot more vicious. Uh, and I never understood that. Now that I have three girls in my family, I'm getting a glimpse of what that might be all about. But, uh, but uh, he, he spent his whole life, again, very quiet, just like, uh, just like Rick mentioned in, in the video very quietly kind of given back in his own way. And I think he represented uh, UMass very well throughout his life. So again, thank you so much for this honor. It's, it's appreciated. And um, again, thank you so much to his teammates and friends who uh, remembered my dad and reached out and, and made this all happen. Well, me and my family will never forget it. Thank you so much.